All right, so we're going to start a new series this, uh, this, this week that we'll go through for uh, until the spring, and we're going to be looking at the life of Abraham. Now, you know Abraham, he uh, is that, that patriarch who is introduced in the book of Genesis, and he's actually one of the towering figures in all of human history. You know, the, the Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians all consider themselves, in a, in a deep sense, children of Abraham. And in, in an essential sense, that's what we all claim to be. Over half of the population of the world today, 5,000 years after his life, half of the world population today traces their spiritual heritage back to the man, the patriarch Abraham. And the other thing about him, I, I think, is Abraham is one of the great visionaries of the Bible. You know, he was someone who God called on, so he set out to uh, discover what all that God has in store for him. And I think, you know, when, you, when, you're starting, when you're starting a church, when you're working in a new city, it's inspiring to see the story of a visionary and how God makes a vision a reality in the life of people. Sometimes it's inspiring, sometimes it's a cautionary tale. But you, you kind of see both in the life of Abraham. So that's what we're going to look at. The story of Abraham's life goes from about Genesis 12 to Genesis 26 or so. And, um, and uh, well, we'll pick, pick it up in uh, Genesis chapter 12. And that's what's printed in your program, starting in Genesis 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abraham, Go out from your land, from your relatives, from your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you. And I'll make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And in the end, all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went. This is God's word for God's children this morning. So I want to look today at what it was, one of the things that made Abraham great. And it was essentially this, is that Abraham was just a regular guy among all the regular guys in his world at his time. And then he received the call of God on his life. What sets Abraham apart, the reason that we're talking about him today is because 5,000 years ago, Abraham received the call of God and then he responded to it. Abraham was, from what we gather from the scriptures, he was a relatively wealthy guy. He was a patriarch. He had, he had lots of uh, bulls and goats and sheep, which was how they measured wealth back in those days before the uh, stock exchange. He was living, living in his, his sort of settled in his, his tribal land with the other members of his family, so he was safe and secure, and he was you know, about as comfortable as life could get 5,000 years ago, you know. You're living in the Middle East and there's no air conditioning, so it wasn't that comfortable. But, <laughs> but, uh, but he, he had a, a safe, secure life, and he was going to live out his life in obscurity with his, with his wife of many years. He was 75 years old, and God calls him. And God says, Abraham, get up. Leave it all behind. Leave your land. Leave your relatives. Leave your father's house and go to where I'm going to show you to go. It's kind of an open-ended call. Like, you're going to go somewhere, and we'll talk about exactly where that is later. And so that's God's call on Abraham's life. He's like, I know you're comfortable. I know you're settled. I know you're around all the people you like to be around. And you can get together on Friday nights, and you can have big birthday parties, and go to everybody's weddings, and all those kinds of things. But now I want you to step out and go somewhere else. And to understand the significance of that, you've got to understand that as if you read the, the first couple chapters of the Bible, humanity's in this sort of steep downward spiral. Remember, Adam and Eve fall, and then they have two sons, Cain and Abel. And their, their sons really don't like each other. In fact, Cain kills Abel. So, so you have the first, uh, first murder in, in the, the children of Adam and Eve. And then things go downhill further. The population grows, but but is totally corrupt, and so God calls Noah. Remember that? And Noah builds the ark, and the rest of humanity is wiped out, and God does a reset. But then Noah's no prize either. He's just as flawed as everybody else. 
and his children are a mess as well. So they try to build the Tower of Babel. Remember that in, in Genesis chapter 10. And God, God is upset with how they're going about that, with what they're doing there. And so God decides to scatter all nations. The only thing God figures he can do with the corruption and with the, with the decline of humanity is to scatter all nations. And so it just looks like the human pro project in the book of Genesis is absolutely hopeless. And then here in Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham. And he says, you know, this particular person, this particular man in this particular way is going to, is going to be the source of the redemption of all humanity. And uh, so that's the promise on Abraham's life. Through you, all nations will be blessed. Abraham, you're going to be the man through whom the redemption of all humanity ultimately happens. But like I mentioned, there's also a substantial cost connected to that. The cost for Abraham is he had to get up, leave his country, leave his leave his people, leave his family behind. Essentially, he had to be willing to become some kind of a, a, a sort of immigrant to a foreign country, a land that was not his own. In fact, a land that was owned and, and controlled by other people. And uh, so Abraham, in, in one sense, is the, the paradigm of what every immigrant is. I, I would bet most of you are you know, if you're not immigrants yourself, I would imagine a lot of you, your parents were immigrants or your grandparents were immigrants. And, and so we have these stories in our family of the adventure that's involved in being an immigrant. And I think sometimes, you know, over the years as I've worked with various people, you, you get a sense of what that call and what that requirement and what that, that demand the demand is to leave behind your country, a place where everything's familiar, to leave behind sort of the cultural awareness that, that you're familiar with, to leave behind even uh, maybe the, the sense of being part of the majority in your country, to, to go be a, a minority in another country, to leave behind in many cases your academic credentials or your educational credentials, which all of a sudden became, become meaningless in the other country. I had a friend who was a doctor in, in China, and he came to America, and the best he could get was a job as a nurse because, his, you know, because of the limits of his language and things like that. But he was happy to be a, a nurse in America uh, because he, he was happy to be here. But those are the costs that inevitably come along with coming to a, to a new place. But why do people do that? I mean, I. I I know in my case, my grandfather was fleeing the communists in Eastern Europe and, and became a refugee and his family moved from country to country to country, but he wouldn't stop until he came to America. Somehow he believed that coming to America would be worth all the trouble and he shouldn't settle. And it was a, was a course of, of many, many years of, of traveling from country to country and settling in, in country, from country to country until he finally got the opportunity to come to America. And I'm rather glad he did because my whole existence was contingent on him doing that. <laughs> but what, what drives people to, to uh, emigrate to another country? Sometimes they're fleeing something, or sometimes it's just the hope, the dream that in a new country, new things will happen in life will, will be better. But Abraham had this vision in, was given this vision in his own life. And for him, it was leaving a settled place, leaving a comfortable place, leaving his family, leaving his prosperity, leaving his protected place to go to a place that he couldn't, that he didn't know anything about, to go to a place where he didn't know what to expect to go on, on that quest. But that is what made Abraham great. That's what enabled Abraham to become the profound figure that we're talking about 5,000 years later, his willingness to respond to that call, his willingness to obey that call, and his willingness to, to follow the call of God on his life. But now, let me just say this. In, in essence, Abraham is all of us when we hear the call of God. Abraham the, the challenge on Abraham is a challenge on all of us if you listen to the voice of God and if you're going to respond 
to what God wants you to do. Because what God calls all of us to do is to say that, you know, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. That's, that's the challenge of being called by God, to recognize that this world is a place of pilgrimage. As, as Peter says, we're aliens and strangers here, and we're moving on to something else. So Abraham was a man called by God, and that's what, what made Abraham great. The, the, the next thing I want you to see is the method he had, the method of God using him, was Abraham blessed God that he would, uh, excuse me, God blessed Abraham that he might be a blessing to others. God says to Abraham, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. And that's, that's the essential formula of how God works in us and how God works through us and, and how God calls us to be in his world as he blesses, blesses us. You know, life for a follower of God essentially is this, to seek the blessing of God on our lives, but then as we know the blessing of God, we need to seek through that to be a blessing to others. Because the dynamics of God's blessing in our life is that it grows as we give it away. It increases as we share it with others. You know, the, and I recognize when I say that, you know, that the word blessing, it's, it's one of the, the most problematic words in, in uh, the Christian community in a sense because it sort of has that church lady ring to it, you know, that word blessing, like, oh, you're such a blessing. It's, it's like something your grandma would say to you, right? And, and so because of that, we, we kind of get disconnected from the, the fact that, that the idea of a spiritual blessing the blessing of God is at the heart of what the Bible is all about. The experience of God's blessing, knowing God's blessing, you know, the, the essence of, of a relationship with God is being blessed by God. And, and the essence of what God calls his people to is to seek his blessing. And uh, if, you read, if you read Genesis, or if you read the Pentateuch, it comes to its conclusion in the, in the book of Deuteronomy. You know, the, the Bible is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy is the very last book, and, and the conclusion of Deuteronomy is, is the catalog of blessings God offers to the people as they're preparing to go into the promised land, the land that God promised to Abraham. And let me just read a little bit of this from, from, Genesis, from Deuteronomy 28. This is, this is what Moses was saying to the people as he's preparing them to go into the land that God had promised to Abraham, and now they're going to claim hundreds of years later. He says... The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he has given you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people as he promised you on oath if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him. Then all the people on earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will fear you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb the young of your livestock and the crops of your ground, the land he swore to your ancestors to give to you. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in the season and bless all the work of your hand. You will lend to many nations but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be on the top, never on the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you, to the right or the left, to following other gods and serving them. So the essence of what God's offering is saying, your children will be, will be blessed, your, your, your livestock will be blessed, your plantings will be blessed, your harvest will be blessed. Every area of your life is going to be blessed as you follow God and as God has his hand on you and God is going to provide for you. And that, that's the essence of, of God's, God's blessing in our lives. It's, it's, I mean, I was thinking about it. The, the blessing of God is kind of, it's, it's essentially what every parent wants to give to their children. You know, kids want a lot of things, but what kids, what parents want for their children isn't exactly the same thing as what kids want for the, themselves. And uh, sometimes I think our problem with God is that we're, we approach God and we're his children, so we want certain things. We can't understand why he doesn't give them to us. But but, uh, all, but at the same time, you understand that as a parent, you, you, know, you're, you want certain things and your parents say no, not because they don't care about you or because they're not committed to you, but because 
they know it's not actually what your life needs. And the blessing of, that's, that's a picture to me of the blessing of God. It's, it's what you actually, not always what you want, not always what you ask for, not always what you pursue, but it's what you actually need to become who God wants you to be. But the heart of the blessing is this, you know, you don't bless yourself. The blessing of God is not something you earn or deserve or achieve or accomplish or something you merit. The blessing of God is a gift. We don't bless ourselves. We don't earn the blessing of God. We receive the blessing of God because it is a gift to us. And it's, it's not something we're entitled to. It's not something we can achieve. It's not something we can accomplish. So, and, you know, I, we are entitled to certain things. We can achieve certain things. We can accomplish certain things. And, and you ought to and you should and you do. But when we're talking about the blessing of God in our life, we're talking about the stuff we didn't earn that we don't deserve, that we can't achieve, that we can't accomplish, but that we've simply received as a gift. And so to understand your life, you've got to understand what are, the bless what are the gifts that I've been given that I need to be grateful for, that I need to, to rest in. And that's, that's the heart of the blessing of God. You know, and what the Bible says is it's good to be selfish for the blessing of God. The Bible warns about being being uh, lustful towards other people. The Bible warns about being greedy about money, but the Bible also encourages us all to seek the blessing of God with all of our hearts and to want the blessing of God in its fullness in our lives. In uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10, there's a famous, or not, not so famous guy. Some of you might have heard of him. His name was Jabez, and he prayed a prayer that got recorded in the Bible, and his prayer was simply this. God, will you please bless me indeed? And it says, the Lord answered his prayer. And so in our own lives, it's good to want the blessing of God. It's good to organize our lives around the pursuit of the blessing of God. There's nothing wrong with being greedy even for the blessing of God because that's what God made you for, and that's, and that's the best thing for you ultimately. So... So that, that's, that's the essence of the blessing of God, but you've got to understand it in terms of what Abraham said here. You've got to understand it in terms of the purpose of the blessing of God. God says to Abraham, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing to others. God's promise to Abraham is that I'm going to bless you in order that you might bless others. And the blessing of God is not something that we receive as an end in itself, for the child of God, for the people of God, the blessing of God is something we receive in order that we might share it with others. God blesses you in order that you might be a blessing to others. So the, and that's the way that the blessing of God multiplies in our life. To understand the essence of the Christian life, Christian prosperity is that we're blessed by God in order that we might be a blessing to others. If you want to know, if you know the blessing of God, You've got to be ready and willing to share that blessing with others. Uh, you know, to understand God's work in your life, I'd say there's, there's two basic questions you've got to be able to answer. One is, how has God blessed you? To understand, to look at your life and say, how has God blessed me? And then the second question is simply this, how can I be a blessing to others? In light of the way God has blessed me, how can I be a blessing to others? Because... This is how God's blessing works, that, that God's blessing in your life will become more real and more vital and more powerful as you leverage it to bless others. And on the other hand, God's blessing in your life will shrink and wither and disappear if you just make it all about you. And, and that's the, the heart of the Christian life. That's the heart of what it means to walk with God. You can tell me how God blessed you, but I'll tell you why God has blessed you. God has blessed you, and all of us here, you know, we're, we're all blessed. Let's, let's just be real about that. Whatever it means, it's, we're all enjoying it in this uh, dry and heated room here in, in America today. But we're all blessed, but the reason God has blessed you is that you might be a blessing. From Abraham, it said, you know, look, look again at, at Genesis 12. I think this is the great pattern. He says, I'm going to make you into a great nation, and, uh, you know, the nation of the children of Abraham, the nation of Israel. 
and I will bless you, and then all nations will be blessed through you. God tells Abraham that, that the blessing of God on your life is going to be for the good of all nations. And that's the truism, truism for all of our lives. And I think one of the challenges in, in America particularly is we tend to become very individualistic and just worried primarily about ourselves and then, if not ourselves, just our own uh, nuclear family and, and the well-being of our own kids and our, you know, and our own immediate relatives and, 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 and things like that. But, but even that can be self-defeating if you're not concerned about something beyond that because you live in a larger world and the well-being and the, the quality of life in the world that you live in is one of the things that's ultimately going to, to define the quality and the blessing that your family experiences. So, so even as, as we seek to, to enjoy God's blessing with our, with our family, with our children and things like that, we need to be aware of and concerned with how we can be a blessing to the greater, the greater world we live in. And it's also a prescription for, I think, for any church. And as we're starting a church, I, I think that, you know, the formula is right there. God, as God blesses us, we can be a blessing till all people are blessed through us. You know, the, the job of a church is to seek, seek the blessing of God for our ministry and for the people who we, who we touch. But to the extent that we know it, we should be asking ourselves the question, how can we bless our friends, how can we bless our neighbors, how can we bless our city, how can we bless our community? You know, and a church that is focused on seeking the blessing of God that we might bless our larger community will be a church that's a bright and shining light of the blessing of God in, in the world that we live in. And on contrary, a church that's simply concerned about its own well-being and its own, its own uh, community is going to be a church that's profoundly limited in and it's, it's personal experience of the blessing of God. So God's method in your life, God's design in your life, is as he blesses you, he calls you and he invites you to bless others. So for Abraham, he's very specific. Abraham, you go, go to this land I'm going to show you. Or it's not that specific. Go, go someplace. I'll, sh I'll, I'll let you know when you get there. Start moving. I'll let you know when you get there. And I'm going to make you into a great nation. Not, you know, it's amazing the, the extent of this promise. Abraham's just a guy, and he's got his, his wife. He's a 75-year-old guy, and he says, but from you, from you and your, your wife is going to come a great nation. So you're going to have this huge legacy. That's what everyone in his age was hoping for. You know, that was the essence of what, what people lived for, to have, to have some kind of a legacy, to have their name live on long after them. And uh, there's only... One catch there. Remember the catch? Abraham's 75. He's been married for 50 plus years, and they haven't had a baby yet. And so for Abraham to step out and to become a great nation that all nations would be blessed through, somehow that baby has to come. You know, the, uh, God's plan through Abraham was to create a great nation that would bless all nations and, th and that was the goal of God in redemptive history was that all nations somehow some way would be redeemed through the work of God and through the people of God and, and that's a theme that's a theme that you see in the whole Old Testament and the interesting thing was as the nation of Israel established itself and, and you know and, and as it struggled they forgot the words of the prophets that are in the book of Isaiah, that are in the, in the book of Amos and Hosea and all these other places about how God's intention is to redeem the whole world and to redeem not just Israel, but to re redeem all the nations. That was God's, God's intention and God's, God's design. And then, you know, it's interesting, if you read the book of Acts, the, the apostles at first are surprised and confused when people who are not part of the nation of Israel start coming to faith in Christ. And they even have a meeting in the book, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15, and they're, they're like, wait a minute, is it, is it right? We hear these stories of, of Gentiles, of non-Jews becoming believers. Can that be? Is that true? And, and they, they actually have a meeting, and they have to argue about it, and their conclusion is, well, it seems to be happening. And then James stands up. James stands up and says, this is exactly what was prophesied in Amos chapter 9. 
where it says, at that time I will rebuild David's fallen tent and all the nations will stream to it. And he could have talked about Isaiah chapter 5 or Isaiah chapter 60, where it talks about all the nations coming to the mountain of the Lord, coming to the temple of the Lord and, and paying their respects and worshiping there. You know, this was a major theme, an important theme, and it, it actually starts right here. I mean, the Great Commission, we think of the Great Commission as something that Jesus gave to his disciples in right before he ascended into heaven at the end of his ministry. But here, God gives the Great Commission to Abraham. And, uh, and that, was, that was Abraham's mission, was to bless all nations. But the catch was, first, he had to have a son. He's going to be the father of many nations, but he doesn't even have one kid. And, you know, he's a wealthy man established in his community with, with his wife there. He's 75 years old. He's past his golden anniversary. He's got everything that the world had to offer in that day except for the one thing he wants, which is a child. But God says, so when God says to him, I'm going to make you into a great nation, one of the things he's promising Abraham is that I'm going to give you a son and your son is going to multiply the blessings that until all nations are blessed through him. Everything else, all these other promises are contingent on Abraham having this child. And so Abraham's quest, you know, it sounds like he was heading out to the land or, exper or pursuing something really abstract or, or something something really erythral, but really what Abraham was longing for, what Abraham was looking for in all this, was that somehow, some way, he would finally have that son who would be his legacy. And that's what opens Abraham up to this idea of stepping out into the, into the world and leaving everything behind to experience that, was that hope for a child, because the blessing would come through a child. The blessing would come through that legacy. And in that way, Abraham is like us, because all, all through history, God works through the child of promise. And, and God works through giving a child in an unexpected way. And so, ultimately, how, was all of, how were all of these promises to Abraham fulfilled? Ultimately, through a child who would come through this nation. When, when God says to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and you will be a blessing and through you all nations will be blessed. Ultimately, what he was promising was one of your ancestors will be the one who will be the source of blessing for this whole world. And that child, the child, Jesus. 3,000 years later, Jesus left his father's home and came to this world as a stranger. Jesus was the ultimate immigrant. He came to this world and he was the only one who was not a son of Adam to ever walk on this world. He came and he was the blessed one. He is the incarnation of blessing. The essence of blessing is the person of Jesus and he came to bless others. And you know the story of the life of Jesus. Everywhere he went he blessed Everyone he touched, he saw a blind man, he touched his face, and the blind man could see. He saw a lame man, and he told him, get up and walk, and the lame man could walk. He saw, he saw a leopard, and a leper, someone afflicted with leprosy, and he reached out and touched his hand, and he was healed. Jesus brought the blessing of God everywhere he went. And Jesus came ultimately to be the ultimate blessing, to reverse the curse that was bringing all of humanity into a downward spiral. But what we know from life, what you know if you've tried to do this, and what we learn definitively in the life of Jesus, is that being a blessing to others is always costly. And being a blessing is difficult. And when you try to, when you find someone who's, who's maybe mired in the curses of their own making and you try to bless them, you try to help them, one of the things you discover is there's no easy way often. And, and you have to give them your attention. Maybe you have to give them your strength. You got to give them your time. Maybe you have to give them their, your money. You have to get emotionally involved in their problems in order to actually make a difference in, in the burdens that they're carrying. There's no way to bur 
unburden someone else without burdening yourself to some level, because being a blessing is costly. There's no easy way to do it. But it was never costly for anyone more than it was costly for Jesus. The deeper the curse someone is mired in, the more it's going to cost you to bless them, the more it's going to cost you to help them. And Jesus was the blessed one, and yet for him to come and to redeem you and me, to redeem the world, to bless the world, he had to take the curse, endure the curse of the world in himself. So he's the final son of Abraham, the ultimate son of Abraham, the ultimate fulfillment of the work of Abraham. Paul says in Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming cursed for us. He redeemed us in order that the blessing that was given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ so that by faith we might receive the promise. Jesus reminds us of the cost of God's blessing, the cost of reversing the curse, the cost of bringing a blessing and restoring and redeeming humanity. But he also reminds us that if we believe in him, if we trust in him, if we look to him, ultimately we are blessed. God's commitment to blessing you and to blessing me is established and is verified because he sent his one and only son to endure the curse, to eat the curse, to suffer the curse, so that you might be blessed. Look to him, remember him, and rest in the blessing of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the final son of Abraham, our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you that he was willing ultimately to be cursed so that ultimately we might be blessed help us to rest in that dynamic to experience that and to live it out pray in his holy name amen